We're going to start a new series called Fresh Air, uh, how the gospel renews and revives us. And so starting off in a new year, it's kind of important for us to refocus on what is the most important thing for us to, to think about, to be purposeful and intentful on. And so with that, I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2, we're going to read a passage that uh, probably is somewhat familiar to some of you, but uh, really is one of those that in Scripture we kind of read over and we're like, oh, that's a great story, and don't really think about what it means to us. And so I want to dive in deeper a little bit more. But as we look at a new year, we always see it as a fresh start. I mean, all of society tells us that after January 1st, Everything is new again, except for your bills are the same, your health is really the same, a lot of the things that you dealt with last year still follow you over into the new year. They don't just magically disappear, but we often think so. For some reason, we think January 1st is some magical day where it just makes things all new. Well, as the week goes on and the the months and then the year finishes on, we often find out that uh, it's not uncommon for people to go from determined to change things and to be a new you for the new year, right? That's one of the sayings. But it's not uncommon to see it go from determined to deflated. That's why over 80% of new year resolutions fail within about two weeks. How many of you have already broken a new year's resolution? Uh-huh. I saw several people. Uh. Yeah, that's why I don't make them. My New Year's resolution is to not make New Year's resolutions. Then I can't fail. <laughs> but that doesn't help me in learning how to be a better me, a more godly me. It doesn't help me with goals. And so that's what I determined to do is I set goals for myself. Uh, not, not New Year's resolutions necessarily, but I set goals that I will work at and I will try hard to reach. And so, in other words, when we're talking about New Year's resolutions and, and new beginnings and new starts, we often had, we, we rush in headlong, determined to make things different. And when we haven't properly prepared or equipped ourselves to do such a task, we find ourselves mentally and physically exhausted. Otherwise known in psychological terms, burnout. You've heard that? We don't want that to happen. I don't want that to, I don't want to see that in our church or in any of you because that's not what God intended for us. So this message is going to be to prepare us and equip us to make some changes spiritually with our, as well as physically. And so with that, let's read this story and see what God's going to share with us today. Starting in verse 41 of Luke chapter 2, we see that it starts off every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12, when Jesus was 12, they went up according to the custom of the festival. And after those days were over, as they were returning, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know. Assuming he was travel with their traveling party, they went a day's journey. And then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem and searched for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. 
And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Jesus replies, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we acknowledge that you are the one true God, and Jesus Christ is our Savior, our perfect sacrifice for our sins. We thank you for the fact that you have sent your Holy Spirit and your Scripture to teach us and to speak to us today. We pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to hear from you and to learn and apply these truths to our lives so we may better follow you and better worship you in our everyday life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, New Year's. We all start with the best intentions, don't we? Okay, maybe you don't. Okay, two of you start with the best intentions. But if we're not properly prepared in advance, we will not accomplish what we want to do. If we're not continually working on our relationship with Christ, we risk facing disappointment, disillusion, and spiritual burnout. Things happen. Life happens. Sometimes, as the world tells us, life sucks. Excuse my language. But that's the truth, and that's probably the best way to say it is life happens, and it just, it's not pretty. It's not the greatest thing to go through. But we need to be prepared. And we see Jesus preparing both himself and his parents for life in this passage. We see them that we're, they're, he's getting everybody ready for what's going to happen for the rest of his life. See, we often think of the gospel of Jesus' life as a great thing. We focus on his birth. Yes, we celebrate Christmas. We love Christmas. We love Christmas in December. It's now January. We don't have to love Christmas. In, no, we love Christmas. But we focus on Jesus' birth and then we jump to his death and his burial and then his resurrection. We highlight those as those are the big things of Jesus' life. And those are the things we need to know for the basics to be a Christian. Those are the things that we know had to happen in order for us to be saved by grace through faith. But if we don't look at the process Jesus went through while he lived his life, See, God did not send his son down to earth just for one day to be the savior of the world. He lived for about 33 years on this planet. Why did he have to live for 33 years? He could have came down as a grown man and died on the cross as a perfect sacrifice. So why did he go through this process? It's because he wanted to show us how to be obedient to God the Father and how to live this life. And so we skip to the end very quickly after we celebrate the birth and we don't look at the in-betweens. And today I want us to spend just a little bit of time looking at the example of Jesus here. There's not too many examples of his early childhood or his uh, early adult life. We don't see Jesus as a teenager. We don't see that he had pimples, we don't see that he had a cough, or we don't see where he went through, you know, the, the terrible twos where he questioned everything. We just get this brief story of his growth and his development. But there's still something here for us. Of course, we see the classic parent-child situation. I couldn't help but think about, as I was reading this and studying this, I mean, how many of you had it with your, had a situation like this with a child 
maybe yours or maybe one of your you know nieces nephews grandchildren where all of a sudden you look around and they're not there Uh uh-huh we kind of all have had that we're like where did you go and i love mary's response here why did you do this to us isn't that a classic mother response why did you do this to us what did i do i mean seriously this was this was jesus just kind of like being honest he's like why are you upset (laughs) of course you don't say that to your mother i learned that very often so but i see this as a relatable situation for us and i wanted you to see that jesus went through a lot of things we did so even as a young boy he had a mom who was a little overprotective sometimes for the right reasons but she loved him and he went on it says that he went with them and was obedient to them even though he was god and he could have said something like listen mary i created you you need to know your place (laughs) Yeah, again, I don't suggest that to you, any of you young children in the room. Just don't. Probably any adult children, don't say that to your parents either because you'll probably still get, yeah. So, but what I do want to see is Jesus demonstrated that spiritual growth and spiritual health was just as important as the physical health. But it has nothing to do with your age. He was about 12 years old. Actually, it says that he was when he was 12 years old, he went up to the customs. So he's sitting there with the teachers of the law and scripture. He's sitting with some of the the most knowledgeable, most studied people about the scripture. And he's doing a few things that helps him grow. And so I want to start off by this. If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to follow in his footsteps, we need to do three things to really help us be prepared. We need to ask questions. He said that it says it right here in scripture that he asked them questions. If you've been under my teachings or if you've been in our church for very long, if you've heard me preach, you know that I am a strong supporter of asking questions questions we need to ask questions we need to ask them of the the stories that we're reading but we need to then seek the answers that's the next thing jesus sought the answers he was listening to them he was listening to the ones who were supposed to know best and he could have as god in the flesh corrected all their wrong thinking But instead, he was listening to them. So when you ask a question, don't immediately assume the answer, but listen to the answer. Seek the answers out. Listen for those things. If you have a question about Scripture, Scripture can answer that. If if you don't know where to find it, that's where myself and several of our Bible teachers in our church are here to help you find the answers. But you need to ask the questions and you need to look for the answers. You need to seek the answers. But the biggest thing, the best thing that you can do for this new year is look for God in everything. Look for God in everything. Jesus was a young boy, 12 years old. And what did he do? He went through the festival, but then all of a sudden he realized that there was more to this festival than just going through the motions. So he had to stay behind. He had to look for God in the details. We need to look for God in our everyday life. It wasn't just the, the you know, holy worship time that Jesus was looking for God. It was every day after that. If you're not looking for God on Mondays, your Mondays are going to be horrible. And same with Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, you may have a few good days here and there, but not ones where you see God at work. And one thing we know from Scripture is God is always at work around us. We are the ones who miss Him. He doesn't stop working, but we miss seeing God in those things. 
So look for God. Ask those questions. Look for the answers. Seek the answers. And if we press on in this way, it becomes easier for us to take big steps, bigger risks that help us expand the kingdom of God. Listen, I've challenged our church this last year, and I'm going to challenge our church even more this year to do some great things for God. Why? Because I believe God wants to use us. I believe God wants to do something with us to affect our community, to affect our country. But we've got to be willing to take the risks. And it has to do with how much faith we have. And Jesus shows us that it's by faith that we grow. But notice, I want to, I want to bring us back. Notice Jesus, while he asked the questions and he sought the answers, he looked for God and everything. He also did something specifically to grow and to check his health in four specific areas. There were four areas. You know, I'm coming up on a year since I had a medical episode, and I have it scheduled where I have a, an, a yearly checkup for these issues. So I'm going to have to go see a couple of doctors, and they're going to ask me all kinds of questions. They're going to take all kinds of tests, and they're going to evaluate. And I see a lot of you nodding your heads. You've gone through that or are getting ready to go through that again for yourselves. We know that, but what do we do spiritually? We don't really have a spiritual doctor to kind of ask us those questions. We can't take a blood test to see how much faith we have. I mean, there's no one really that goes and checks, you know, the levels of our faith and our study of Scripture to see whether we're healthy there. But Jesus shows us there's four specific areas where we need to check our health. And each one's connected to each other. Each one helps each other or affects each other, I should say. The first is, the Bible tells us in verse 52 that Jesus increased in wisdom. In wisdom. This is your psychological health. Now I know, some of you don't like thinking in those terms. Your psychological health. This is, this is something that we often will kind of push aside because where in scripture we talk about the psychological health? Actually, it's just about everywhere. If you really know what you're looking for, God speaks a lot about our psychological health, your mental health. But see, wisdom is a little bit different than what we typically think of. Some of us think that simply just because we can pass a Bible quiz or a Bible test. Did any of you see our new uh, announcements where they went through the quizzing? Did any of you play along with that? Did any of you get any of them right? Like, who got, like, two? I see, I see two people who say, yeah, maybe. Uh, uh. <laughs> That's knowledge. I'm not talking about your Bible knowledge. I'm talking about wisdom. Wisdom is different than knowledge. Knowledge is knowing what to do. Wisdom is actually doing it. Wisdom is to think before you actually speak. I know for some of you, that's hard. But thinking before you speak is wise. The Bible says so. You should learn this. Jesus listened. He asked questions. That's why in James chapter 1, it says for us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Some of you have that backwards. You're quick to get angry, you are quick to speak, and you are very slow at listening. And that's not the way that the Bible wants us. That's not the way God designed us. Someone, you know, jokingly said, God gave you two ears to listen and only one mouth to speak. I quickly point out that the, my mouth is bigger than my ears, so take it or leave it if you want to deal with that. But I love this. Wisdom is learning to do the right thing 
all the time. C.S. Lewis has this uh, quote. He says, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. That's wisdom. Wisdom is doing the right thing even when no one's watching, even when no one cares, even when society is doing the opposite. Being a wise person, being someone who grows in wisdom and is healthy uh, in their wisdom is someone who will do what is right all the time. Why? Because Not because you want to be a goody two-shoes. It's because that's what God expects of us. Listen, we're all going to fail. I don't have a disillusioned uh, vision of this. But our spiritual health is where we do the right thing more often than we do the wrong thing. So, Jesus grew in wisdom. We need to grow in wisdom. How is your, how's your mental health these days? How's your psychological health these days? If it's not good, then maybe this year we need to focus on some of that. And Jesus has a lot of answers in Scripture for us to deal with our psychological health. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. I love, if you actually go back and read it, it says, whatever you eat. I love how God knows the human mind. Our mind always goes to food first, doesn't it? So whatever you eat for the glory of God. By the way, burnt offering was a sacrifice to God. I love barbecue. So see, I could biblically prove that I'm supposed to eat burnt meat. Uh, so <laughs> I won't go off on that. But whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you say, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything in your life needs to be focused on the glory of God. The chief end of man is to know God and glorify him. And so our next thing is Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Stature. It's such a weird word. Basically, this is your physical health. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I don't want to hound you. I don't want to try to be a nutritionist. I don't want to try to be a physical therapist. We have those in our church. They can hound you all they want. That's their gift to you. <laughs> I love that our physical therapist is limited right now, so I can, I can run and she won't catch me yet. But 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your physical body is still affected, uh, still affects your spiritual life. So, physical health is about knowing that you're on the right track. I'm not trying to say that you have to be the perfect body size, that you have to be the, 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 the you know, pinnacle of health. You don't need to be the perfect specimen of a bodybuilder or anything like that. Each one of us are created differently and our bodies are made differently. What I'm saying about spirit, uh, physical health is that we need to not neglect it. You could be spiritually good. You could be spiritually healthy and spiritually whole. But if you're not physically healthy and neglect that physical side of it, then you're going to affect what you can do for the glory of God. Now, unhealthy physically person is limited on how they can serve God. Let me tell you how I've seen this. I've taken several mission trips. You can't go to a foreign country if you have let your physical health go. The travel, the physical uh, stress on, on you, all those things will take place. But I know that we don't have any international mission trips planned for this next year. So let me just take you back just to this summer. We had tons of kids here for vacation Bible school. If you're not physically healthy to try to keep up with those kids, they're going to run all over you. Now, of course, I know that there are some things that we have no control over. Age, 
sickness. We have a lot of people sick in our church right now. They didn't choose to be sick. We have accidents. You know, falling off ladders somehow affects us. We can't control those things, and they affect our physical health. But to the best of our ability, we need to be physically healthy. We need to check on our physical health. That's why I won't argue when my wife says, you need to go to the doctor and get this checked out. I won't argue with her anymore because I want to be around for a long time to see what God is going to do with me. And so, to be wise in how we use this body for the kingdom of God is to know our physical health. So we've covered two of them. We have our health, our wisdom health, our psychological health. We have our physical health. And then the next one, it says that he grew, Jesus grew in favor with God. This would be our spiritual health. Our spiritual growth. The spiritual part of our lives that we need to be growing in. You know, in biology, they taught me that if things are not growing, they're dying. So either your spiritual life, you're, you're still growing, or you're on the downhill side and you are spiritually dying. That's what science tells us. And I have no reason in Scripture to argue with it. Because when we're done spiritually growing, why doesn't you know, God just take us? He has a purpose for us on this earth and we need to spiritually grow spiritually. That's why in Micah 6 it says that we need to walk humbly with our God. To walk humbly with our God. That's a spiritual term to walk with God. We need to grow in our relationship with God. How does that work? Well, first of all, your study of Scripture. If you're not studying Scripture, you can't grow. That's why our small groups are a big part of learning to grow spiritually. We study scripture in our small groups. If you're in a small group that doesn't open its Bible regularly, tell me and I'm going to have a talk with your, your leader. And if you're in my group, well, go ahead and tell me anyways. I'm going to have a talk with your leader. Yeah. It's going to be in a mirror, but... No, we need to be opening our scripture, our, our Bibles regularly to grow and to deal with our spiritual health. Prayer. I think this is one where I know a lot of Christians struggle with, your prayer life. How often do you go to God with what's on your heart, what's on your mind? Over the last couple of weeks, I've, I've had a problem sleeping and... I'll wake up in the middle of the night around 2 o'clock. For some reason, it's always 2 o'clock. I don't know why 2 o'clock. But when I have, for the first while, I just tried to fight it. I was like, no, I'll just go back to sleep. I'll fight this. I'll, I'll be able to handle it. And then I realized, what if God's trying to get my attention for something? So I started praying. God, speak to me. God, I'm listening to you. God, what is it that you put on my mind? And besides the random songs at two in the morning that pop into my mind, there's a lot of concerns that I have over our church, over some of you. I pray. I pray at that time. I also pray in the morning when I get up. I'm not one of a morning person. I have to have a cup of coffee first. But after I get the first jolt of caffeine in me, I start praying. I pray in the middle of the day. I pray at night. Prayer needs to be a priority if we're going to, to grow spiritually. Worship. Serving. I could go on and on about spiritual disciplines, but we need to be ready and we need to check on our spiritual health and we need to be growing spiritually. So setting spiritual goals for this next year is a priority. Not to earn favor with God. Let me, let me make that very clear. You can't do anything to make God love you more than he already does. This is not to earn favor with God. It's to simply know him more and to make him known. That's what our spiritual life is about. To know God more and to make him known. Of course, 
We can be good church-going Christians and we can know this. But my question today is, do we actually practice it? Are we actually growing spiritually? Can you look over the past year and see where your faith increased? Where your passion for scriptures increased? Where your passion for worship, your desire to know God more, did that change over this last year? Or is it the same? If it hasn't changed in a while, I'd be concerned because our physical health is always changing. So should our spiritual health. So, the other thing here is that Jesus grew in favor with God and with people. In favor with God and with man. That is our social status. And I'm not talking about your Facebook account or your Instagram or your whatever else you may have. I don't want to go down the list because it's too long. And some of you probably don't even know what half of them are. But I'm not talking about your online social status. I'm talking about your interactions with other human beings, with other people. See, we don't put a priority on that, but yet we find it here in Scripture. Jesus grew in favor with people. His relationship with one another, with, with the people around him. Why do you think it was important for him to follow his parents and be obedient to them? He could have, he could have just declared himself an adult right there at 12 years old, and he would have known how to live the rest of his life. He is God in the flesh. But as a 12-year-old, he submitted himself. He needed to have a good relationship with his parents. That didn't change at some magical age and, and just he was able to say, enough, I'm, I'm done listening to my parents. He saw to have a good relationship with them. He became more responsible for his own actions, but he still had to have a good relationship with them. As Christians, we're supposed to not only have a good relationship with God, but with people. That's why he instruct us to, instructed us to love our neighbors. And then someone was smart enough to ask Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? If you don't know that story, look it up. But basically, it's whoever is around you is basically your neighbor. So whether you like them or not, they're still your neighbors, and you need to love them. Why? Because God says so. And if you're doing it to honor God, God will give you the power and the ability to do it. That's why in Romans 12 it says that as, mu as, as much as possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you. If they decide to be mad at you, that's their choice. You can't control someone else. But as far as it depends on you, Live at peace. What, what does that mean? When you have done something wrong, apologize. Admit it. Own up to it. When you see them in a, in a mood that, you know, they're down, they're struggling, encourage them. When you see someone in need, as far as it's possible, as much as it's possible with you, do what you can to meet that need. If not, help them find someone who can meet that need. These are the things that Jesus taught us. This simple passage teaches us that to have a new beginning, to have a fresh start for the new year, we need to check on our spiritual health, our physical health, our mental health, and then our relational health, our social status. Jesus was a friend to the poor and the rich. He was a friend to the sinners and to the righteous. He was a friend to the popular and the lonely. There was no one outside of his scope of vision and reach. He looked for everyone who could use his help. 
He was the master networker because people knew who Jesus was and they wanted to be around him. Jesus did not have any favoritism with class or creed or tongue. By the way, you know Jesus didn't speak English, right? Just to clarify that, there's a lot of American Christians who think Jesus only spoke King James English or English in general. He didn't. We see a lot of people on good terms with God. Good Christians that know to study their Bible, to pray, to be in church. But we know some of those good Christians that don't have a good reputation. And that's actually a bad thing. Our relationship with others affects our relationship with God. Like it or not, you can argue with me all you want, but our relationship with others affects our relationship with God. So if we're going to become spiritually mature, if we're going to grow and see God do something in us this next year, we need to check on this, the health of these four areas in our life. We need to grow in these areas of our life. So let me ask you, how are you doing? 